Good afternoon and uh, greetings from a reasonably sunny day in Brisbane. Um, Bill and uh, Pete have asked me to put this together mainly because of the travel restrictions that are stopping me from coming down and, and having a face-to-face -face meeting. So what I've done is put a, together a few bits and pieces, hopefully that will generate um, some questions um, that we can answer in August at our next meeting. Anyway, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how much does the previous crop influence today's decisions? So I guess where I'm coming from with this is that over the last few years, um, through the farming systems projects, we've been noticing something about cover and how at the end of a season, the chickpea plots have a lot more water in them than the summer than the wheat plots. Yet, by the time we get through to planting the following season, the wheat plots have far more water in them than the summer plots. So if you're looking at this figure here, we're basically saying that from November, the blue line is equivalent to wheat. So it has less water at, in November but it fills up faster, where the chickpea plot has more water in November, but doesn't fill up as well, basically due to cover. So I figured let's have a look at that and we'll see what sort of scenario and whether that plays out in the Liverpool Plains over this last season. So what I've done, a bit of a background to the scenario, um, the scenario started on the 28th of February, and I assumed that we had 100 mil, a uh, 28th of February in 2018, and I assumed that we had 100 mils of stored water, which is about 27% of the profile. Scenario one was a wheat chickpea rotation. So in 2018, we have wheat plants at 100 plants per metre squared, 250 mil row spacing, planted on the 15th of May. Then the following 15th of May, a year later, we plant chickpea into that stubble at about 40 plants per metre on a 500 millimetre row spacing. Again, I did it on the 15th of May just to keep everything simple. Um, so then we look at how long it takes to refill that soil from until this week to see how much water is in it in this past week. That was scenario one. Scenario two is exactly the reverse of it. We have a chickpea crop, then a wheat crop. Everything else is exactly the same. And just to keep things interesting, I threw in a scenario three, which was a sorghum crop. So this is coming from sorghum in, um, I didn't even put a date there, look at that. So that would have been a sorghum crop that was planted on the, in the 15th of October, 2018 long fallowed through till now, ready to go into a crop now. Okay, so what I did was build, put together a simulation. I've then plotted the simulation and show the amount of soil water that has occurred in it. Now, some of you have seen these little movies that I've made and um, I can sit here and let it run slowly. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, this green line here is the drained upper limit. That's the maximum amount of water a soil can hold. The purpley line is the lower limit. That's how much water the crop can suck to. It can't get any of the water below that. And the blue bit is the amount of plant available water that the crop has. So as you can see, they're all behaving exactly the same in the early part, because this is the early part of 2018 and we didn't plant until May. So let's speed things up a little bit and we'll get to planting. And you can see still that in 2018, they're all much the same. You'll see the sorghum crop continues to, um, because it hasn't been planted yet, is going to start putting water on while the other two are drinking water. And you can see that the wheat crop is drinking or using water a lot faster than the chickpea crop. Pretty nothing strange there. So there we go. 
the chickpea crop by uh, the wheat crop by August has pretty well run out of water. Chickpea crop still has a little bit. Um, I can't remember the exact harvest dates, but I'd say we'd be getting pretty close to them now uh, in 2018. And you can see that the sorghum crop uh, will have just been planted. It was planted on the 15th of uh, October. So both chickpea wheat and the wheat chickpea rotation are now about to start refilling. And they do. I'm going to jump ahead now through to the end of that crop until about November last year. So it was a pretty dry year. I don't suppose I have to tell anybody that. Okay, so here we've got basically no water in the chickpea wheat rotation or in the wheat chickpea rotation. And what we're doing is looking at the fallow and seeing how fast they refill. My assumption was that the chickpea wheat fallow would fill faster than the wheat chickpea because we've got the last crop was wheat. We've got a nice cereal stubble that would so that we have a good cover, cereal stubble, help infiltration. Uh, the chickpea, the wheat chickpea rotation would fill more slowly because being a legume, it breaks, the stubble breaks down quickly, um, exposing the soil. Therefore, we have bare soil, lower infiltration rates. So here we go. They start out pretty much the same. Let's not worry about the sorghum crop at the moment yet because it's still but already we're starting to see that the wheat chickpea rotation had more water. You're starting to get more water into it. And as it fills, again, it's not a huge amount, but there does appear to be more water in that wheat chickpea rotation. And there we are, as we've got to this week. There is certainly more water in this lost my mouse in this chickpea wheat in the wheat chickpea rotation than in that chickpea wheat rotation so why I didn't expect this um, and so I thought I'll have to go and work out exactly what's going on so this is what we've just seen the purple line is our wheat chickpea rotation so if you follow that the first crop, the first biomass accumulation crop, or the sort of S shape that's being formed, that is the wheat crop. The wheat crop is then harvested, and the next purple line is a sorghum crop. Oh, sorry, sorghum crop, a chickpea crop. If we look here, this for the green wheat. The green line is the chickpea wheat crop. Again, the chickpea is at the start is green and then the second one is the wheat. So you can really see that 2019 was a dry year and neither the chickpeas nor the wheat did terribly well. There's a message in that. If we move on and we look at what happened to the soil water, you can see here following the wheat crop, the purple line. So we're following it down. The wheat crop extracted the most amount of water while it was growing, more than the chickpea. Though the chickpea did sort of match the wheat by the end. The wheat crop refilled faster. And so went into the second crop, the second season, which was chickpeas to be planted with more water than what the chickpea um, rotation had had. So here, that theory holds exactly as we thought would happen. However, following on this year, they've swapped over. 
And here, we're starting to see the crop that was chickpea last year accumulating more water than the crop that was wheat last year. Why? It all comes down to cover and the amount of surface organic matter that was on the soil surface. Again, following these lines through, you can see that the purple line, which was wheat first, I'm just checking that I've got the right one, <laughs> which was wheat first, had the most cover. The green line, the dark green line, which was the chickpea, um, its cover broke down quickly due to the high nitrogen. Then when we hit 2019, and not a lot of cover was applied, but the chickpea still had all that wheat stubble from 2018. So the extra wheat stubble plus the chickpea stubble is what helped get that greater infiltration where the poor season of 2019 with a poor wheat crop, a sparse wheat crop on top of an already bare chickpea crop meant that there was less cover and less infiltration. The light green line, which is the sorghum, is probably there more for just interest, but it does support the idea that the more cover, which was there because of the sorghum being harvested much in a different sort of season, uh, provided more cover and had the greatest infiltration of water. Probably quite a bit there. You may need to sit and look at it and think about it, but I'm happy to answer any questions. So quickly, just a few conclusions. Cover improves water infiltration, but just don't think about the last crop, especially if last year was a really poor growing season. You're not going to have much stubble and therefore the stubble, especially cereal stubble from the previous year may be what saves you. One thing to think about when you're talking cover is there is a limit. Some is good, but bucket loads is not much better. So especially in environments where you can grow big crops, having a huge amount of stubble lying on the surface can, is, there is a trade-off. It can promote disease and it can also disrupt and make planting difficulty, planting difficult. But you guys know more about that than me. So another question that I've been copying lately is, is can, and for those of you who are growing canola, this is less of an issue, I guess, in the Liverpool Plains or um, northern New South Wales. Uh, and most of these questions have been coming from southern uh, Australia and southern New South Wales. But the big question everyone's saying is, is canola advancing quicker this year? These are a few shots uh, from trials that I have around uh, South Australia, Western Australia and uh, southern New South Wales, where we're starting to get to green bud a little bit earlier and early flowering. So thinking about that, canola is a plant that, ha that responds to cold. Uh, to, get to, to get to flowering, you need to use a degree days, a thermal time um, relationship. So the plant is, the development of the plant is determined by the temperature. Now, you can, that temperature, or the amount of temperature that you need to get to flowering can be reduced if you have long days. That's not really an issue for us at the moment since we're uh, a couple of days off the shortest day of the year. So let's forget that one and move straight on to vernal time. Vernal time is something that again, certain plants are responsive to cold temperatures. And a vernal day is a day that's less than 15 degrees or fractions of the day that are less than 15 to 
degrees, degrees will accumulate this vernal time. As you accumulate, the more vernal time you get, it reduces the amount of time, thermal time you need to get to flowering. So what does all that mean? Well, the more cold you have, some varieties, and it is present in some um, summer type varieties, they will respond to that cold and shorten the time they need to get to flowering. So what I've done here is just looked at three environments, Gunnedah, Corinda and Spring Ridge, and I've accumulated the thermal time from the 15th of May, uh, from the 1st of May, sorry. So I assumed if you planted a canola crop on the 1st of May, uh, you would have had this dark green line is this year. The next lighter green line is last year and the really pale line, which you may have trouble seeing, it's very pale, um, is the long-term average. So you can see that the last couple of years we've been accumulating more cold than normal, than on, than on average. The average I used was the last 50 years. Thermal time is the amount of growing temperature that, that plants will respond to. So, and, and again here, you can see that thermal time has been a bit less in Ganada, Karindai, and in Spring Ridge this year, where last year it was pretty close to um, on the average. So what does that mean? If we stick it together, one of the methods I use is just a simple thing of the ratio of cold days to warm days, or the ratio of cold of vernal days to thermal time. And what that means is that this year, we're accumulating more vernal time than th for each unit of thermal time. So it's, it's a bit colder, we're still accumulating thermal time, and this is what's shortening the season and making those canola plants flower a little bit earlier. <laughs> but only those that are vernal sensitive. Something like diamond, just a variety I can think of off the top of my head, doesn't have any of this sensitivity, so it would be just powering along at its usual rate and flowering when it should. But some of the more mid-season varieties that have a bit of vern in them, usually it's usually used to sort of hold them back a bit. They're rushing ahead and, and getting on to flowering. So a few final thoughts. It's a really quick summary and I know uh, it's probably fairly hard to follow. Please ask some questions. Have a look at it. Does what I've presented reflect your observations? If not, let's talk about it and see what we can work out. And how have my assumptions been? I'm sure not all of you have planted exactly on the 15th of May, two years in a row. That's one of the luxuries a modeler has. But anyway, I hope that it is some useful or stimulated some thought. What next? I guess if any of this has stimulated some questions, discuss them, talk to Pete and Bill about them, and they'll get them on to me and we'll see what modelling we can do or what else we can do to answer some other questions. And I guess finally give some feedback as to whether you reckon doing things this way is of any use. Um, I'd much rather be there talking to you and hopefully within the next few months that will be a reality. Okay, thanks for your time. See ya.